Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel. Very much looking forward to hearing from our wonderful panelists this afternoon. And I think in the um, arcade tradition of this year, we're going to jump right in. Um, in the festival program, if you'd like to find out more about the work that our panelists are doing, you're very welcome to read their bios and find out more about their work that way. So, we'll jump right in. So, this afternoon, we are speaking about the challenges um, that our panelists have encountered in terms of um, providing access to writing in general. And they'll also be highlighting some new developments in their work that they're seeing. And I think we'll also be talking, obviously, about the effect of the last few years of the pandemic, um, business models. What's that looking like? What changes are we seeing? Um, and I will start with my extreme right, <laughs> Ate Dotun, who came up to me this afternoon, by the way, and said hello in Kiswahili. Very, very impressive. So you get to go first for that. Um, so Ade, if I can call you that, I remember a few years ago, it must have been around a decade ago, I was having a conversation with a Nigerian publisher, Egosai Masuen. He was in Nairobi at the time for a festival. Festivals make the world go round. They're an economy of themselves. Um, and he was a bit frustrated. We were talking specifically about post offices and the collapse of post offices. And again, this was probably 10, 12 years ago. Um, so perhaps not as relevant today. Um, and his view at the time that he was sharing with, with me was that to be a publisher or a book distributor also meant building entire systems or of, of infrastructure. Um, and in relation to that, there's someone who's a pretty big deal in the tech world who's from Kenya. Her name is Ori Okolo. And she has spoken in the past about um, the fact that we cannot entrepreneur our way out of broken systems. Now, you have stores in Lagos and Abuja. As far as I understand, Roving Heights is, is a popular destination for book buyers. Um, and someone in this audience this afternoon described you as um, a Nigerian rising to a Nigerian problem. Do you think the problem you're tackling is universal or specific to Nigeria in terms of distribution of work? Uh, thank you very much, Angela. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to uh, express my profound appreciation to Lola uh, for uh, inviting me to talk about my work, uh, work rather, and, and also to learn from everybody who's in the book space. Um, so to your question, um, Angela, I think uh, distribution is not a problem that is um, peculiar to Nigeria. I think it's an, uh, it's an African problem. And I say this because I've had the privilege of living and working in East Africa, of Tanzania, and I guess that explains where I could, um, uh, you know, speak a smattering of Kiswahili. So yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, um, so I imagine living in Dar es Salaam and um, you know wanting to buy a book from, say, um, you know, what's the name of that bookstore, um, Sleepway, in, you know, in, in Dar es Salaam, and then you're you're in um, somewhere in, um, let me think of. Um, you're in Arusha or in some remote village. It will take you perhaps maybe twice the price of the book to be able to get it to uh, to wherever you are. And I think it's a challenge that you that everyone who's interested in who's, who works in the book space, you know, um, you know, they encounter every time, right? You know, so um, someone is in Benue State. So let me think of a small town in Benue, like Boko, in um, North Central Nigeria, and you're a big fan of you know, Lola Shunei's books of writings, and you want to buy uh, The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's you know, wife, the price of the book is 2,500 naira, and just so you can wrap your head around, say, well, that's about five, five, six dollars. And if you, you know, place a call to Rovi Knight or you order it on our website, um, it will probably take, you know, 2,500 naira to get that book delivered to you in Benue. So imagine buying a $10 book and, you know, spending $10 to also, you know, get the book dispatched. And so that means, you know, you have to think of creative ways to be able to, one, bring down the costs, you know, of, of, of logistics, of getting book, you know, down to the last mile, or figuring out creative ways to ensure that, like, you know, you don't have to spend that much money if out of your, your meager earnings, you're, <laughs> you're fortunate to be a book lover and you want to buy a book every month. You know, so you find publishers, you know, that are looking for avenues. You find bookstores that are looking for avenues to bring, you know, books closer to readers. And so I see people leveraging uh, on infrastructure of, of chain supermarkets. So I see um, a publisher like Masobe Books, um, who's, you know, riding on the back of um, of a chain pharmacy 
store in Nigeria, Med Plus. So I was in the Med store um, outlet somewhere, you know, in Abuja. And I said, oh, they have a stand where their books are, you know, displayed. And you find, you know, some other, you know, bookstores and or booksellers are you know, exploring the partnerships with cafes, with restaurants to say, you have these vacant spaces here, like, you know, how about you put a shelf here and then, you know, so um, if someone calls and says, oh, I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in, um, uh, I'm in um, uh, Cardano and I want to buy a book, I can say, well, why don't you go to Fasa Cafe? There's a stand there where you can, they also have a bookshelf or there's a restaurant somewhere where you can. So I think it's a challenge and, you know, it's figuring out what's the best way, right? Uh, the post offices are there, um, I think that hopefully when they become more modern, when they become more responsive to, you know, to the needs of, 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 the, of the market that they are, they are actually meant to serve, perhaps you know, the cost of, of getting books down to the last mile will come significantly you know, down here. Okay. Thank you for that. I'll jump on to you, um, Amma. We've been having several conversations over the last few years around your business model um, and the fact that um, Aco Books which is Ghana's first publisher and digital distributor of African audiobooks, um, is, is definitely, it's the same business, it's built on different infrastructure. You're leveraging on technology a lot more and obviously relying on, on audio storytelling as the format. Um, what's been the uptake of this so far? Hello, and uh, very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Lola. This is my first Aki. So I am just so delighted to be here. So, um, audiobooks. Um, just taking on from what uh, Ad Ad Dutin, Dutin says about um, Africa being such a massive continent and just the physical difficulty of getting books from one continent to another, you hear just even the discoverability how do you know who's writing science fiction in Cameroon? Who's writing romance in Nigeria? Who's writing um, historical fiction in Ghana? It's just so very difficult to get um, answers to these things. I wanted to build a platform where discoverability of African books would be a lot easier. And I wanted to build it using devices that everybody carries us around um, already. I mean, everybody in the room here has a mobile phone, I'm really sure. And I think, for me, publishers would um, understand that the potential to transform a mobile phone into a digital library of books um, would open up so many opportunities for access to books. So I started my business with audio, in particular because my mother was a writer and she lost her sight about 20 years ago. So the physical book was not, uh, you know, was not an option for her. She said she was too old to learn Braille and so audiobooks became her life. We started listening to audiobooks from the days of books on tape to now, of course, it was DVD, then it's become streaming audio. She subscribed to several audiobook services. But we found out um, very soon that the African books were not available. So I'll be talking about a new book. Mum couldn't listen to it. And I started to think about, I come from a technology background. Why aren't we having more audiobooks? Africans are wonderful storytellers. We come from an oral tradition. We have wonderful voices. And what I realized also from listening to audiobooks was that a lot of the Africans who do publish their books in the West because now the publishing, the digital publishing scene is very much multifaceted. Um, when someone releases a book, they release it in all its formats, print, ebook, and audio. That's not happening so much on the continent. But uh, when, when Africans publish with Western uh, publishers, they have their books interpreted and read by um, Americans or Europeans or the country that they published in. Sometimes that doesn't give a very authentic experience. And in the audiobook publishing world, people love listening to their own accents, their own narrators, their own storytellers telling story te um, stories in their own languages. So um, I started my service primarily first as a service for getting um, blind and visually impaired people access to books. 
But fast forward, audio has become a major commercial platform. Podcasting is on the rise, especially during the period of COVID when a lot of people are stuck at home, tired of watching TV, a lot of people started tuning into listening. And um, so during that time, the uptake um, of our platform really increased. Um, the reach we grew by word of mouth. We have a small platform, a small catalog of about 100 books um, producing. We are both a publisher and a platform, so it takes time to sort of work those two business models. But a recent partnership with um, MTN through their IOBA African app has really helped us to reach a lot of customers. Um, we joined IOBA's, MTN's IOBA platform in March, and to, to that, since that time, we've had about 160,000 subscribers to our platform. However, that platform is free. It's free data, zero rated content. I think that plays a huge part in uptake. Costs of data is a big factor in accessing digital books, but I still believe that it's a huge potential to um, get people access to books. We will be relaunching our platform uh, in December. It will include audiobooks and a catalog of books from around um, the world. African books, not only produced on the continent, but some of the books that we've been longing to listen to, um, but we are restricted because they are locked in on Audible or platforms that are not accessible to the Africans on the continent. And um, we're looking to um, have a platform that we can monetize and use, get some of those 180,000 people who've been listening for free, are uh, enjoying audiobooks. We'll, it will come the test to see whether they're ready to pay for those audiobooks. Thank you. And thank you for highlighting that. Obviously, we have a lot of writers in the room. Um, and I'm not going to wait to get to the Q&A part because I know this will be a burning question around free access to the content. Um, from what you've explained, it sounds like it's a little bit of a freemium model where you get people signed up, they're on the platform, they're consuming content, and then the idea is that you monetize a little further down the road. Um, could we talk a little bit more about that model and, and perhaps address um, you know, with the writers in mind. <laughs> That's right. The idea right now is just to build the audiobook listening community. It's a new community. Uh, music, streaming music, streaming video is very popular on the continent. Netflix, DSTV, Iroko TV, a lot of streaming uh, services are very popular among uh, the young people, which is our target um, uh, place. But um, audiobooks is new. So the idea is let's give um, people a taste of audiobooks. So we have uh, excerpts from books, uh, one or two full length audiobooks, so mostly excerpts, a couple of chapters, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, if it's smaller books, we, if we, with the, um, the publishers are, um, if the publishers are agreeable, we do do free content and the interest is there. So the idea is grow the community and the user base, get them hooked, interested and excited about audiobooks. And then when we launch our platform, our current platform is really small. Our new platform will have about 5,000 books. We're getting titles from Recorded Books, WF House, Hachette Audio. We're trying to sign on um, publishers who have African either authored or narrated books in their catalogs and bring them into our platform, and then we will monetize. We're going to have a subscription-based, a credit-based uh, model, starting from $2, which will give you one book a month, up to $9, which will give you four audiobooks, which we believe will be a fairly affordable model um, for people to get started. So there'll be something for everything, everyone. We will have some free books also within the catalog. So, and we always have free content for people to, to listen to. We are also expanding our um, narrator base. We really, and I'd like, would like to talk to that a little bit later on about the whole 
audiobook production plays? How do we get narrators? We're looking for top quality narrators and storytellers to work with us. Yeah, wonderful. And maybe we can provide you with some quick data because data is queen. Let's call it queen. I don't know how many, how many people are audiobook consumers consistently. Okay, okay. That's a fair amount. Are we um, consuming via Spotify? Audible? Okay, Audible is a popular one. I see. Okay, okay, there you go. <laughs> but that's your yep. market research. Yep. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So I think on the same platforms, you know, I, I, I believe our core books is available both on Android and iOS. And internet. It's web-based as Boom. well. Mm -hmm. There you go. So definitely worth checking out, and we'll talk a little bit more when we come back around about languages and, and what sort of languages you're producing the content in. Um, we're going to move to a different part of the conversation when it comes to access. Um, and your work um, has been very fascinating to look at, I have to say, um, quite close to my hat in the sense that, um, like the work we're doing in Nairobi with BookBank, you're also looking at libraries, you're looking at communities of people, you're working with um, marginalized voices, so definitely looking at that segment of people um, in terms of access and focusing, focusing on that. You wear many hats, um, I believe you own a publishing house, you're a writer yourself, um, and you're also an editor. Um, with your foundation, specifically with Yasmin El Rufai, you're, you're providing access to arts and culture in general um, in northern Nigeria. And I was also informed that you're educating young girls and women, re-educating them, um, who've been married without an education. Um, you're re-educating them for about a year, teaching them to read and write. What role do these opportunities um, play in leveling the field, in your view? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm really glad to be here. And um, like the others have mentioned, I'm grateful to Lola for inviting me. Um, well, about my foundation, it's true. We have two key goals. We encourage young people to enhance their creative writing abilities. And also, we work with young women who have um, not had the opportunity to further their studies. You know, especially in the North, um, many women drop out of school, some due to early marriage, and there are so many other factors as well, including a lack of funds. The families always prefer to educate the men rather than the women who will be married off and go somewhere else. So what we do is we work with these women and we find that they are really very interested in enhancing their liter uh, literacy skills. And uh, our belief is that once you give somebody that literacy in the world of today, um, you've opened doors for that person as long as the person is not lazy. Um, because at the end of the literacy, pro literacy program, we also give them computer training. So our belief is that once you are able to access information on the internet, which is free, information is now basically free, they can learn whatever they need to learn, rather than organizing women and saying, okay, we'll teach them how to make soap. Once you give them that ability to research themselves, they'll be able to do that. Because when you go to YouTube, you see how to do so many things. And as for the younger people, we, we organize competitions for them and um, give them workshops. And we have a mentorship program where we match them with mentors to work with them. It's actually as a result of that that I decided to start a publishing company because we realize that a lot of our young people in the North are very, very talented. But for some reason, it's like 
they are not seen. So I started this company, Almara, with a particular goal in mind, which is to bring out voices from underrepresented people and also to bring out um, stories that are not known. You know, we are one Nigeria, but we all know that we have different cultures in the different regions. And I have to say that what most people know about Nigeria, especially globally, is from Southern Nigerian perspective. Meanwhile, there are so many stories that I would like to tell that come from up north. So this thing is mainly about inclusivity. We want to be inclusive. We want better representation. So I want to encourage our writers, not just northern writers, as long as you have a story that is coming from the north, we want to encourage them by giving them access to publishing. And um, so far, we have, um, we have a website that we've called for um, entries. And probably because we're not that well known, we haven't had so many um, entries yet. Um, I think the problem with not having northern voices or northern stories so much represented, especially globally, um, has to do with the fact that I think sometimes our own writers do not have the um, audacity or whatever I should say to send in their works to other publishing uh, companies. So I believe that they might feel more confident in sending works to a publisher that they know they can relate to. And also there's the fact that sometimes the best person that can assess your work is somebody that knows the context of where you're coming from. Because some stories, if the person assessing has no idea, you might not find it interesting. So this is just, what I'm trying to do is just to give access to a wider, um, well, a wider group of writers so that there would be better inclusiveness um, and our underrepresented stories can be heard globally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about more representation, which is wonderful. Um, something that you said, I'm assuming, did you say that you, you are getting new content by doing public call-outs? You'll be doing public call-outs. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, another thing I've been thinking about in terms of um, access in this conversation has been around, I think there are a few pandemic novels in the room, or short stories. There must, yes. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Wanjiro. Um, there were, during the lockdown, that whole time, it was really interesting to see the, the role that social media played in connecting all of us, um, but also in creating new marketplaces for writing um, and just general kind of distribution of words, you know, across the continent, outside this continent itself. So let's talk about social media for a bit. Um, one of the sharp areas that, that was, um, one of the sharp areas of focus out of this pandemic was a kind of the digital divide. Um, between different strata of society, which is in itself a reflection of, of realities, um, barriers in the physical world. Um, how has being active on social media propelled business for Roving Heights for you, Ade? Thanks, Angela. Um, so one thing that is worth um, you know, uh, putting out there quickly is the fact that we started out as an online bookstore. You know, uh, we started out, you know, um, selling books via Instagram. So people would um, send us DMs, you know, and, and I remember when we started out, there was, you know, this whole um, skepticism around, oh, you're just, perhaps you're just another faceless business. You don't have an address. You know, uh, how am I sure that if I pay you upfront, you're going to get my books delivered, you know, and, and those sort of things. 
Um, and, and increasingly, uh, we realize that you know, it's, you know, social media, as more people were signing up for, uh, signing up on Instagram, and more people were getting on Twitter and on Facebook, people became more comfortable with the idea of like, oh yeah, they've posted this book on Instagram, uh, and then you know, people are talking about you know, these kinds of you know, uh, books, you know, and then growing communities like the bookstagrammers uh, that have helped you know, uh, books uh, do well. Um, and, I, and I think the whole TikTok thing is even a separate conversation on itself, even where before TikTok became, TikTok became you know, the rage. You know, so we started out being uh, an Instagram you know, bookseller, uh, and then we realized that people wanted to have, you know, come into physical spaces where they could touch the book. And also having a physical space also sort of helped us with legitimacy, knowing that you're not just another faceless business that I'm going to pay and then you disappear, you know, for, what, for whatever reason. So I think that, you know, um, and, and I see the same thing in, in other parts of the continent as well, right? You know, Lowe Books in, in, uh, in Kenya. I hope I got the pronunciation right. Lowe, L-O-L-W-E. In Kisumu, yes, yeah, yes. in Kenya, you know, they're also an online store, um, you know, and you find, you know, some in other parts of the continent as well, where people are writing on, you know, on, on the tools of social media to be able to promote books. So I think it's it's something that has helped a great deal to give books one visibility. You know, more people, as more people are signing up on Instagram, on Twitter, you know, more books are getting visibility. So um, off the back of, you know, hashtags, you know, books have sold hundreds, in some cases thousands. Uh, because someone has, you know, written a book, and the bookstagrammers are talking up the books, uh, so we're seeing like, you know, right, you know, rising, you know, in book sales on the back of that. And during the pandemic as well, when people were were at home, you know, for us, you know, the challenge then was people are ordering books because they're at home. How do we figure out how to get these books, you know, um, you know, you know, to them? So um, I I think that um, you know the social media um, platforms will continue to um, drive. You know, trends, positive trends. You know, as and some people might have expressed pessimism that you know people are spending so much time on on social media, and so it's going to kill interest in books and reading. But what we are starting to see is that you know this um, you know those these platforms are actually driving more interest in books. You know, you find whole communities around, like you know, uh, on Instagram, you find you know TikTokers. When we go for book uh, book fairs internationally, you get you know, catalogs that are, say, you know, talking about the books, these are the books that are doing well on, on, on Instagram, or on TikTok, I beg your pardon. And I think it represents an opportunity for, uh, for those in the publishing space to see how can we leverage this trend to also drive more interesting books? How can we use these numbers, the numbers that we see? So when we post books on our social media handles, we, we're very heavy on analytics. We go back and see how many people downloaded those books to say, you know, I'm going to add to my to be read books or um, how many people are, you know, are interacting and engaging with the post. Those are like really good proxies for us as to how those books will sell. So if I post a book on Instagram and maybe four or five likes and nobody download, downloaded the book, it tells me like maybe there's something about how people are connecting or how this you know, particular work is, you know, is, is going to be perceived. Thank you. Um, thank you. Anything on social media, Alma? Yes, um, just like uh, Doton said, um, I think social media has, has become a crucial part of um, the whole book lovers um, network, you know, the community of people who read, who share um, about the books they're reading, um, and a lot of followers. Um, um, book, I think they're called book talkers, right? Book talk. Um, and just recently, Penguin Random House has um, had a partnership with some of the book talkers who are bringing many, many uh, readers to their platforms. Um, Arco Books doesn't have a TikTok account at the moment. We are mostly on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram. Um, because I thought, oh, audio doesn't really fit in with some of these platforms. But I began to take another look at it, and I'm, I'm looking for African book talkers who might be able to talk about the books in audio format, who might help us to share their excitement about a particular book. And it's quite exciting. We're looking at, uh, in the next few months, if we can get a few people, young people, to help us um, drive 
readership and interest in books on those platforms. Um, ah, someone's pointing to one. Wow, that's exciting. Um, we, during COVID for us, um, it was a time where we focused a lot on children's books and early literacy programs. Um, Ghana government did a lot on radio uh, to support early literacy. And those radio programs were broadcast like Monday to Friday, and it was just teaching because that two year period really disrupted you know, early primary school readers who were learning to read. So they did a radio series, um, but the thing with the series was they broadcast it once, I think they did a second repeat, and then that was it. If you missed it, you wouldn't be able to get the um, audio recording again. So we were able to go to government and say, look, we have an audio hosting platform. Why can't we, we would, we'll be happy to host it for you so that um, parents can have it on demand. Some children just need to hear a lesson a few times before they can get it. And, and also the convenience of being able to listen with your child, because during that time, a lot of parents were looking for, you know, um, ways to earn some money because they were not working or they were laid off. And so um, having a platform where we could host audio um, so that children could listen was really important. And, and um, we use social media to help um, um, broadcast about those. And, and, and it was very successful. Mm. 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 Okay. So book talkers need to sidebar Ama. Yeah? I see. I see a collaboration cooking here. Um, this morning when Professor Howard French was talking about, um, well, he was talking about very many things, but one of the things that he said was that Nigeria is looking at um, propelling towards 850 million people in terms of population. And I was thinking about just the sheer amount of languages that are spoken here and the sheer amount of marketplace as well. Um, Ama, for you, on Accor Books, what languages are people listening to audiobooks in? What's popular? What's popping? <laughs> um, mostly English, sadly, because English is a dominant language of publishing. But um, definitely for me, I'm really passionate about um, the possibility of listening to audio stories in many other languages. Um, but the challenges are a lot of publishers aren't publishing in, in our local languages. We have a few Ghanaian language um, storybooks on our platform. We have uh, languages, uh, we have Cree, we have Ga, um, but that's about it. And we're looking at how can we get more. Um, because the dominant language of publishing is English, then it's difficult to have access to the materials and then when we get those materials, then we'll have, have to have access to narrators who can read the stories in those languages. And it's been quite interesting. We did a project for, um, uh, what do you call that? It was a, a company that was doing social um, financial services, and they had a financial literacy course for um, women uh, um, low literacy level women. They did an audio financial literacy course, teaching women how to use their mobile phones to, you know, save, uh, make payments, and do other things. And they wanted that series done in six Ghanaian languages. So we had to have the series. It was done, written in English. We had to have it translated and find readers to do it. And it was quite a challenge especially for the northern languages in Ghana, to find readers who could read fluently financial terminology and, you know, make it readable. So I think in terms of translation um, straight from English into Ghanaian languages or into African languages, there'll be a challenge. I'm looking to see authors who will write first in the local language straight away. So it's not a question of your translating from English into, um, you know, local languages. And I think that will make for a more fluent read 
and make it much uh, more enjoyable. But we are really open to all languages. My vision is to have ARCO Books as a pan-African platform, all the African languages. You can listen to books in whatever language you want. And we want to grow um, that relationship with publishers who are publishing in local languages, yes. Mm, thank you. Is it the same for you with languages, with Amara Books? Are you looking at English or English and others? Actually, we're just looking at English. Um, as you mentioned, you know there's a huge challenge we face in Africa and even in Nigeria when you talk about publishing in our local languages. For instance, in Nigeria alone, we have close to 300 different languages. So I think that alone, the sheer number is a problem. So we are just looking at publishing in English language. I just want to add one thing. We're a new publishing company, and since we started, we've just been thinking about traditional publishing, but having come to this festival, which is one of the gains of coming to such festivals, I am beginning to get another idea because of the, we have a long history of oral, oral storytelling. Therefore, I think it would be a good idea. We could, you know, trans we could um, change our text to an oral yeah. reading so that we can have the kind of audio books. I haven't thought about that before, but I think it's a good idea. And at the same time, we can also, you know, change audio. We can have uh, people that want to tell their stories and that are not necessarily writers come and tell us their story and we can transcribe that into text. I think that is something that uh, we should consider. So, you know, I like working with young people, but unfortunately I can be quite old fashioned. I like to read the book book. I like e-books, but I have never really listened to a whole audio book, but um, I think it might not be such a bad idea, and now that we are talking about it, <laughs> I will start. I was, I was going to ask you what the future looks like, but I think you've described it beautifully. Um, and now we should open up to the floor in case there are any questions from the audience. I see a hand, blessing Musariri at the back. Uh, Mike is coming to you. There you go. Oh, um, I'm just interested in, um, in terms of the future of um, the platforms that um, you are using. Because um, I was just thinking, my sister has been following, I don't know whether it's Bookstack or one of those um, apps where she says she's following the serialization of a story and she says, you know, the writing isn't good, but the story is very engaging, and she, she stays on it because she wants to hear how it ends. And I was just thinking in terms of social media and things like that, especially in terms of audiobooks, and um, the, the idea that somebody could tell a story, um, our tradition of storytelling is oral, is there no, like, um, interest in having stories told, like uh, somebody who wants to tell a story and then serializing it, because I think that's something that people would be really interested to follow, especially people who can't read, and they want to listen to a story, especially, you know, there's um, stories that are really quite, that are people who can tell a story so sensationally that you will have a whole nation hooked on it. And I think this is something that, you know, um, should be explored. And I don't know if any of you would be thinking along those lines. Are any of you thinking along those lines? <laughs> Thank you, Blessing. Um, and that reminds me about a kind of similar model on, I don't know how many people are listening to, to Serial, mm -hmm. but I, I was hooked. I was hooked on Serial, which is exactly the, the model that you're describing. I think there's a huge potential market 
um, for those kind of models. And anyone who's in publishing and definitely thinking about leveraging technology should be thinking about the possibilities in that direction. I absolutely agree with you. However, Archibooks only works with published writers. And the reason that we do that, and, and there's this whole interesting thing about is oral superior to written text and so on. But what I find is that we're not a full editing publishing house. And so when we work with people who are just doing, you know, manuscripts straight to audio, the whole editing, crafting the story, we, we don't have the resources to, you know, to produce it properly because an engaging serial has to be well written. And I find a lot of people, um, spoken word artists, just think that it's just, you know, record, saying some stuff, recording it, and that's a captivating story. There needs to be an editing process. So a published book has already gone through that process. However, I do love the idea, Audible has this thing called Audible Originals. They have people who write for that format. They get experienced writers who write for that um, straight into audio format. We would love to see um, writers who would be interested in that kind of format. Um, I don't think it's as simple as just having anybody come and record a story and it will be captivating. I think there'll be quite a lot of work to craft it and to make it a, you know, a fully fledged, ready to go story. So we, um, we work with um, published work that has already gone through that process. But I really do love the idea of, you know, ready to go into audio. And one of the really most ex interesting things I, I listened to last year was interactive audio stories, where you can listen to a story on Alexa and interact with the story. So you can, you know, you listen to part of the narrative and then it pauses and it asks you a question. You can branch to many different, you know, choose the direction in which the story goes, which I found really exciting. And I think it's very similar to our African style of storytelling, especially with folk tales. It's very, um, it's very interactive. And a storyteller can change the story depending on the audience. And I thought that was really exciting. I'd love to see writers who would be interested in writing that genre and um, creating audio. So I think there's, there's a lot of interesting experiences around audio that we can, we would like to tap in and, and build and uh, um, continue to get our exciting stories out, out there to everyone. That sounds like an open field for another area of collaboration. They keep streaming in. Let's go. Um, we have another question. We have a hand up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chisu. I wanted to ask, concerning um, book distribution, um, how do you guys navigate, say, piracy? Because I think piracy affects both book distributors and um, also the authors who write them. Because if more of your books are being pirated than the actual ones that were distributed by the legit, legitimate publishing house are being sold, then the, both the authors and the books, maybe the booksellers might also be patronizing the pirated copies as well. So it might not even be affecting the booksellers as much as it's doing the authors. So it's possible, yeah. So I wanted to ask, how do they, how do you navigate these things? How do you pick and choose between um, pirated books and original ones? Do you just buy all of them and sell and say, okay, we are making money from all of them and stuff like that? Thank you. Um, I think you should take that one. Are booksellers colluding with with? Uh, that's, that's, a very, that, that's a very interesting you know, question. I think, you know, just so you know, Paris is not peculiar to, you know, to, to the continent. It's a global problem, right? You know, and, and, and I think that um, the role of the bookseller in, in, in helping to uh, tackle the problem is one of um, ensuring that the books are sourced directly from 
publishers or the you know the right or the legitimate distributor. So sometimes as booksellers, we've had cause to um, to not to carry titles whose suspects we uh, we we imagine are you know I mean origin we suspect are you know dubious, right? You know, so I, I see there's a there's a new flood, uh, new wave of a type of a particular series, pay setters. You know that that is flooding the market, and I remember once having to talk to one of the writers to, to say, "Hey, this book used to be published in the mid '80s and early '90s, and they are now back in print. And you've written one for for uh, written a book in the series. Are you aware that it's back in print now?" And the doctor said, "No, I'm not aware. Like, you know, I mean, and and so at that moment, I realized that you know the origin of that particular series perhaps is, is dubious. So uh, it's a challenge, and I think that you know if you also pay close attention, you realize that." The pirates only, um, you know, um, they only thrive on like popular books, you know. So sometimes when you talk to the publishers, you know, whether Nigerian and like, oh, they are pirating my books now, they're like, well, the only ones that they are pirating are the popular ones, the ones that are in demand. So one is an indication that there's a lot of demand, and that's in fact valuable feedback for the publishers because sometimes they don't have, you know, record of the data, you know, of what people are, you know, people are trying to read. Uh, and I also think that it's a collective problem, both you know, for, for the sector. So you as a reader also have an obligation to only buy original books. So if a book is sold for 3,000 era in traffic and the original copy is for 5,000 era, you know that you know, by buying the pirated copy, even though it's 2,000 era cheaper, you are you know, you're shortchanging the publisher or, or the author of the book. So I think it's a problem that you know, it's something that we all in the entire space, depending on where we are on the value chain, we need to uh, you know, tackle together. Stop patronizing pirates. But I think that the broader challenge is one solving that access problem because a lot of times the reason why piracy thrives is because people can't even find the original copies to buy. So there's an economic problem of people don't have the means, but there's also the access problem of they can't find the original books to buy. So it's figuring out how do we increase access to those books so that if people want to buy the original books, they are able to access them. Thanks. Uh, I'd just like to add to that because it is a problem in the digital space as well, and partly it is access. If everybody has their own copy, then there's no need to pirate. And I think it's easier to have your own copy in digital. But I think there's also a culture of um, ownership of um, our relationship with books. And I remember as a child, I don't think I bought a book until I was in my 20s, because I would go to the library I go to the library, borrow a book, myself and my sisters, I have three, two sisters, we borrow seven books each, come home with 21 books, read them for two weeks, go back and change. So we didn't have to buy books. And I think, you know, with young people, the idea of buying every single book that you want to read is really hard. So I think publishers have to be, you know, aware of this and be cognizant about how do we give solutions to young people who have a certain culture. They don't buy YouTube videos, they don't buy, you know, Spotify and music. So why should they buy books? So how do we make them aware that piracy is wrong, totally believe it's wrong, cannot steal, you have to pay for the intellectual property of somebody's work? authors, creatives have to be rewarded. And, but how do we tackle that consumerism culture of everything should be free, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Amma. We have a very enthusiastic hand up. Abdul Karim. Uh, microphone, we've got about two and a half minutes um, left on this panel. So let's be brisk with it, please. Um, Thank you. Like she said, my name is Abdul Karim. Um, I have a question for uh, Ms. Hadiza. Um, I would like to know just how much interest you know is there in the from the buying public for books um, published in Hausa. I, I don't know if maybe you've tackled it earlier. That's, um, I'll just ask all three, then I'll sit down. <laughs> then for Ms. Ama, um, how do you market? You know, like ebooks. Um, I, I still don't think they've reached the point where they're like mega profitable. So, how do you market them? You know, well, we Africans, we like to actually touch the books and feel them, you know. I mean, I, mean, I, I do both ebooks, hard copy. Yeah. 
So that's for you and for Mr. Dotung. Um, we're, we're doing much better, you know, with African writers or Nigerian writers in bookstores. You walk and sometimes half the books are from Nigerian or African writers. Um, but still, those are like the ones from the major established publishing houses. How about the ones who self-publish or the indie publishers? What, what do you guys do differently to like sort of push them? Because I know some of them from experience. I know some of them just come, drop books, and leave. So do you do anything extra to like push their work? That's all. Thank you, Abdul Karim. Um, those are three questions. Shall we, shall we take the first one? We've yes. got a minute to go. And okay. then I suggest that you grab the other two panelists and have that conversation with them after this panel. OK, I'll try and be quick. But uh, it's a very interesting question because there is really a huge, huge, huge market for Hausa literature. You know, there's what we call Kano market literature. They are very prolific writers in the Hausa language. They churn out books. Most of these books are self-published. But uh, my interest really, like I said earlier, is to bring to awareness underrepresented people. And unfortunately, when you write in Hausa, you're only catering to the Hausa market. My interest is to expose our stories all over the world. So ultimately, it has to be in English. But having said that, there's also the fact of translation. I don't know how good we are in translation in Nigeria because some of these um, books that are published in Kano, self-published, many of them, of course, are just easy, romantic love stories, but there are a few ones that are really, really good, and I believe if they can be translated to English language, they will make an impact. But um, I'm not really conversant with the way translation works, but really there's a huge market for Hausa literature. Thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our wonderful panelists this afternoon. Hadiza Erufai, Ahmed Dadson, Adidu Tune Inade. Um, Hadiza's book, An Abundance of Scorpions, is available downstairs, so if you do want to grab a copy, she can sign it for you. Thank you very, very much, and um, see you all over the next couple of days. <laughs>